In this lecture, we'll be looking at the life and work of German philosopher and economist Karl Marx, and we'll be looking at the ways in which um, his work influenced Western political and intellectual traditions. We'll be dealing with Marx um, significantly throughout the rest of the semester as well. Karl Marx was an influential German philosopher, economist, and revolutionary. Marx worked in a wide range of fields, and his theories about history, society, culture, economics, and politics continue to influence modern scholars and occasionally revolutionaries. However, his name and work have become highly politicized, and frequently people use the terms Marx or Marxism as pejoratives. Um, I've also found that most non-academics have little real familiarity with Marx and his works. Interestingly, I have a friend on the far political right who denounced as Marxists both Mitt Romney and John McCain in two successive presidential elections. And I find that when the term Marxist is being tossed around in this way, um, it's clear to me that at least that there is a significant um, disconnect happening with the term. For the record, I am rather apolitical, but as a historian, I like to provide clarity and precision in my classroom discussions related to Marx. Um, early in Marx's career, he worked as a journalist, writing about conditions in European factories and industrial settings. Most of his major works were composed in London between the years 1849 and 1883. Uh, Marx often collaborated with Friedrich Engels. Friedrich Engels was born in 1820 in Prussia. He was the oldest son of a wealthy German manufacturer. In 1842, he moved to England to work in his father's textile factory in Manchester. In part, his parents hoped that the move would put an end to the radical beliefs Engels was espousing with his German friends. On his way to Manchester, Engels first met Marx, and he submitted a few articles to a journal Marx edited. And it was in Manchester that Engels saw firsthand some of the problems that he would publicize in his most famous work, the 1844 book entitled The Condition of the Working Class in England. In particular, he uh, um, described child labor, the exploitation of children in factories, the poverty and the misery um, experienced by industrial workers and the unemployed in the area around Manchester. Engels became a close associate of Marx, and he edited most of the major works of Marx. Let's briefly examine a few terms related to the work of Karl Marx. Again, sometimes these terms get tossed around by politicians and pundits as ways to demonize their opponents. Uh, Marxist is a person whose political philosophy embraces elements of the philosophies and writings of Marx and Engels. Marxism uh, is the political philosophy uh, for adherents of Marxism, class struggle plays the most important role in transitioning from capitalism to utopian socialism, they believe, um, comes after capitalism. A Marxist analysis, though, is something uh, significantly different, um, though it is related to the ideas put together by Karl Marx. Scholars using ideas of class struggle to explain historical and social phenomena are employing Marxist analysis on some level. A person does not need to be a Marxist to employ Marxist analysis. Theoretically, a person might even be a card-carrying member of the Republican Party and use uh, Marxist analysis to explain historical events, though that person might not choose to call this analysis Marxist. The classic example of Marxist analysis would be a labor strike. The workers want better pay and better working conditions, while the company wants to keep costs low. It is this conflict between the workers and the company um, that drives the historical events known as a strike and what follows afterwards. Beyond the revolutionary applications of Marxism, the writings of Marx had profound effects on a number of intellectual disciplines. Uh, Marx, for example, divided history into distinct periods, which was an innovation in the way that history could be portrayed. Um, while the Marxist practice of dividing society into classes was not necessarily an invention, 
Uh, Marx's method of explaining socioeconomic classes in terms of economic phenomena was very innovative for its time. He brought new insights into economic explanations for the origin of the value of a commodity and his explanations of the conflict between ideas and people advanced many fields, especially history, sociology, and political science. Uh, one of the most enduring theories of Marx is something known as dialectic materialism. Um, Marx was originally a follower of the teachings of German philosopher Georg Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel, one of the leading theorists of the German idealist school. I'm doing sort of a disservice to Hegel by simplifying him, but I want to give you at least a little sense of where Hegel was coming from and how Marx used Hegel. Uh, Hegel argued that the theory of ideas goes through three dialectical uh, stages of development. First, there is a thesis in terms of ideas. Um, the thesis gives rise to a response known as the antithesis or the antithesis. This contradicts or negates the thesis. Um, finally, the conflict between the two ideas is resolved by means of a synthesis. Synthesis is what comes out of this clash between the thesis and antithesis. The synthesis then becomes the new thesis. A new antithesis rises in opposition to it, and the cycle continues ad infinitum into the future. Marx modified the Hegelian dialectic and applied a version of this theory to provide a uh, material explanation for human history. He argued that every economic system grows to a state of maximum power and maximum efficiency, but at the same time, each economic system develops internal contradictions and weaknesses that contribute to its eventual decay. In the chart on this slide, the conflict between feudal lords and landless peasants gives rise to medieval cities where feudal lords no longer held sway. Yet in the medieval city, there were conflicts between wealthy property owners and workers, which gave rise to the guild, rise to the guild system. Uh, this conflict between guilds and wealthy city residents gave rise to the entrepreneurial class, or the capitalist class, according to Marx. And this new thesis, then, gave rise to an antithesis in the form of impoverished industrial workers that he called the proletariat. Marx uh, held that uh, stateless communism would inevitably emerge in the post-capitalist world, and Marx and Engels set out to publish their new theories. It is tempting to look at the year of production of this next work and think that Marx and Engels had some influence on the revolutions of 1848, but in reality this is not the case. And in 1848, Marx and Engels were relatively unknown in Europe, outside of uh, small academic circles. And they were liberal revolutionaries of 1848, and uh, by liberal again I'm referring to classical liberals, uh, did not have much in common with the radical movement espoused by Marx and Engels. The leading revolutionaries of 1848 were primarily interested in, um, in things like representative democracy, and free market ideology, not a radical overturning of the social and political order in Europe. Um, some of the things that uh, Marx and Engels called for in the Communist Manifesto are, are, are worth exploring a little bit. Um, they called for the expropriation of property in land, so all rents of land would go to public purposes instead of to landlords. Uh, Marx and Engels called for a progressive tax income income tax, rather, as well as the abolition of the right of inheritance. So by progressive income tax, um, they felt the rich should pay more in terms of percentage and the poor should pay a little less. Uh, Marx and Engels believe that government should confiscate the property of people who have left the country or people who are rebelling since they could not effectively take care of the land. Uh, Marx called for the centralization of credit in the hands of the government, and the preferred mechanism would be a national bank with state capital and an exclusive monopoly on credit and printing of currency. Some of these things um, have sort of been adopted by uh, Western-style um, capitalist democracies. Uh, he believed transportation should be in the hands of the state, that uh, factories and instruments of production should be owned by the state, and... Uh, free education, 
for all children in public schools along with the abolition of uh, children's labor in factories. The first chapter of the Communist Manifesto hints at the analysis used by Marx and Engels, the history of all hitherto existing society is the history of class struggle. So again, this idea that's class struggle or competition um, between groups for over, over either the modes of production or for resources that drives history. Um, themes that were outlined in the Communist Manifesto would be further developed in the later writings of Marx. The most noteworthy, or if you prefer, the most infamous work of Marx is Das Kapital. The English translation of the title is Capital, a Critique of Political Economy. Capital is a three-volume work published over the course of four decades, with the first volume being published in 1867. There was a fourth volume planned by Marx. In fact, the second and third volumes were actually uh, published posthumously based on his notes. Engels was able to put together those extra volumes. The texts are critical analyses of capitalism, and uh, they purport to explain the economic laws of capitalist modes of production. Marx uses the text to determine and to demonstrate how capitalism is the predecessor of a socialist utopia. This work, however, was much more than sort of a narrative history. Marx intended capital to be a scientific system that could accurately explain the historical unfolding of events. Toward the end of his life, Marx began to recognize that many people who claimed to be Marxists were deviating significantly from his theories. A quote on this slide is from the late 1870s, and Marx was expressing frustration at uh, French political activists who did not seem to have a very solid grasp of his work, and yet were calling themselves Marxists or socialists. In particular, Marx denounced socialists and communists who promoted the idea that communist revolution could occur in a pre-industrial society. Marx argued that capitalism was a necessary step in human development and human history, and that there was no way to shortcut or s skip this step. Marx believed that rural peasants were, in particular, very conservative traditionalists, and that a society that was still largely rural and agricultural was just not ready for a communist revolution. I suppose that if Marx were to have lived long enough, he likely would have dismissed the theories of such revolutionaries as Vladimir Lenin, uh, Joseph Stalin, and Mao Zedong as preposterous, as each of these individuals believed that peasants could make ideal radicals and that a, a radical movement could occur in a country that was not yet industrialized. Um, this draws to a close our brief look at Marx and Marxism.